this video, we're going to talk about water balance and how that relates to the kidney. Hey, what's up, you guys, and welcome back to my channel. So this video kicks off the first of our fluid and electrolyte series. So today, we're going to look at how the kidneys regulate water balance. We're going to take a look at each part of the nephron and see whether water gets reabsorbed in those parts. And then we're going to get a look at a pretty important hormone, ADH. And as always, this lecture is going to build the basis for pathology lectures later on. So grab some coffee and let's get started. So the first concept that we need to understand is that the kidneys cannot replace lost water volume. They can only conserve it. So normally, if we are hydrated, the kidneys will filter and reabsorb water. But if we are overhydrated, so say you just drank two liters of water, those two liters will eventually get filtered. And since the body doesn't need all that excess water, the kidneys will choose not to reabsorb it. So water gets filtered and it doesn't get reabsorbed, which means it gets excreted in our urine. But if we are dehydrated, that's a different story. Say you're working a 12 hour shift and it's super busy. You haven't had time to drink water. Your kidneys are still filtering your blood, but since you haven't drank much water, they know they need to conserve your volume. So they reabsorb as much fluid as they can, which means your urine will be really concentrated and it will take a lot longer for your bladder to fill up which is sometimes why those of us who work long shifts might not pee for 13 hours. And I feel like we all understand this, but this is the point I wanted to get across. If there is severe fluid loss, and I'm talking significant dehydration, glomerular filtration rate will just come to a halt, and this will impair kidney function. And we'll talk about this in later lectures, but this is one of the causes of acute kidney injury. Okay, so in order to conserve volume, we just saw that the kidneys concentrate our urine. And there are certain mechanisms in the kidney that allow urine to be four times as concentrated as blood. So when we talk about how concentrated something is, we talk about its osmolarity. So how many solutes does something have in it? And for the purposes of this lecture, we will abbreviate osmolarity as M-O-S-M -S for milliosmoles. So remember that the kidney has two parts, an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex has an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. And the osmolarity of the medulla ranges from 300 at the top all the way to 1200 milliosmoles at the bottom. You'll find the 1200 milliosmoles at the most inferior portion of the medulla where the collecting ducts empty into the renal pelvis. So fluid that enters the proximal tubule is isoosmotic to the plasma. Iso means the same. So it has the same concentration as the fluid in the plasma. As fluid goes from the proximal tubule into the loop of Henle, the concentration of the filtrate changes. The descending limb of the loop of Henle allows fluid to be reabsorbed. So at the bottom of the loop of Henle, the filtrate is very concentrated. But as the filtrate goes back up the ascending limb, only solutes are reabsorbed which means that the filtrate in the ascending limb becomes less concentrated because now all those solutes just left. And fluid leaving the loop of Henle is about 100 milliosmoles. We now call this fluid hypoosmotic, hypo meaning lower. This fluid has a lower osmolarity than the interstitial fluid of the cortex and also of the blood. Once fluid is in the distal nephron, which is again the distal tubule and the collecting duct, reabsorption of water occurs under the control of hormones. So if the distal nephron is impermeable to water, then the filtrate remains really dilute. But if the body needs to reabsorb water, 
then it can put aquaporins in the membrane of the distal nephron. This lets water flow by way of osmosis to get reabsorbed. And if all possible water is reabsorbed, this leaves the filtrate concentrated at 1200 milliosmoles. Okay, so let's talk about hormones and how that affects water reabsorption. So a very important hormone that we need to discuss is antidiuretic hormone, which is abbreviated ADH. Now this hormone is also called vasopressin. And like I just mentioned, this hormone puts water pores called aquaporins in the membrane of the collecting duct. This allows water to be reabsorbed by way of osmosis, because remember, the filtrate is hypoosmotic and has a lower osmolarity than the blood. And the name antidiuretic hormone means to be against urination. Diuretic means to urinate and anti means to be against. So antidiuretic hormone is against urination, which means we are going to reabsorb as much water as we possibly can. So antidiuretic hormone is actually produced by the hypothalamus and it is stored in the posterior pituitary, which is just a gland inferior to the hypothalamus. And so once ADH gets released, it gets released from the posterior pituitary and it goes to the kidneys to cause the reabsorption of water. And what's interesting is that ADH is not either on or off. Its levels are variable and the amount of ADH we have correlates with how many aquaporins are inserted into the collecting duct. So if we are really dehydrated, maybe our ADH level is really high and a lot of water porins are placed in the collecting duct. Okay, so the pituitary releases ADH, but what actually causes this release? Well, I'm so glad you asked. There are three stimuli that cause the release of vasopressin. The first one is plasma osmolarity, the second one is blood volume, and the third one is blood pressure. So the most powerful stimulus is an increase in plasma osmolarity. Osmoreceptors are neurons that sense an increase in osmolarity. These receptors are located in the hypothalamus. When the plasma osmolarity rises above 280 milliosmoles, osmoreceptors fire and cause the release of ADH. A decrease in blood pressure can also stimulate ADH release, although to a lesser extent. Baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic arteries sense a low blood pressure. These receptors signal the hypothalamus to then release ADH so we can retain fluid. And more fluid increases the hydrostatic pressure in the blood, and this increases our blood pressure. The last stimulus we mentioned is blood volume. With a lower blood volume, we have less venous return to the heart. This means that there is a decreased atrial stretch. This decrease actually signals the hypothalamus to release vasopressin and therefore cause the reabsorption of water. The reabsorption of water will increase our fluid volume and therefore increase atrial stretch. Hey guys, welcome back. Thanks for giving me your attention for the last few minutes. Now, I hope you understand water balance a little better. If you got value out of this video, then tap the like button. If you think it could help somebody, then don't forget to share it with them. And always subscribe so you don't miss my videos posting every week. Stay safe and I'll see you guys next time.